All right. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters of Church of the Servants. Thank you so much for having me and providing space for me this morning. And I'm so thankful to be a member of such a grand congregation that is filled with so much love and passion for the Lord. I began my time here a few years ago during an internship. But most importantly, I began my time here when my life was in a phase of major transition. A series of closed doors and redirections were taking place. But through my time as an intern at COS, I was able to see the church in new and wonderful ways. And as I began to spend more time at COS, I just couldn't leave, and I knew I needed to stay here. And this was a time in my life that needed direction and something new to take place. And COS has been a foundational place, both for my years of seminary work, some pretty hard years of seminary work at that, but also for my soul and a place to come and simply be myself. And the Lord brought me to COS to help prepare me and prepare my way for something that I had no idea, and in some ways still have no idea, what would take place. And we find ourselves in a similar spot of transition and preparation in our First Kings 5 text this morning. This small section of the grand story of First and Second Kings and an even bigger part of the grand narrative of Scripture is one that can be easily overlooked, but is definitely necessary for our studies of the Word. And it has great importance as well. In 1 Kings 5, Solomon is gathering, and building, materi gathering building materials and establishing alliances, not only just to build the temple, but to, for potential building relationships. Chapter 5 opens with King Haram of Tyre, he expresses affirmation for the newly anointed King Solomon. And after receiving these words of support, the newly anointed King is asking for help. And he sends a letter to Haram expressing this task that he has been given from the Lord to build a temple in his name. And after receiving this letter, Haram acts on that. But what's really interesting about this letter, about this temple, is that this temple has been in the works for quite some time. We can look back in 2 Samuel 7 when King David is asking the Lord if he should build a temple in his name. And the Lord tells David, no, but that he will continue the house of David and that, his, and that David's son will build the holy temple. And Solomon references this in his letter to Haram. And he also explains that his father David had enemies on all sides, which caused a lot of attention and a lack of peace. And therefore, he had no peace to build the temple. But Solomon has this peace. Solomon has been granted rest and space to build and prepare. All is well with King Solomon. Solomon continues to explain that he will be needing many cedars or many trees from Lebanon. And Solomon ends the letter by addressing the logistics of payment and a request for help of men from Haram, since there were not skilled laborers in timber in his community. And after receiving Solomon's letter, Haram holds to the loyalty that he has to King David and is willing to work with Solomon. This response of loyalty is one of loyalty to David's house, and it is an arrangement of mutual benefit for both Solomon and Haram. Solomon will be getting resources, mainly the trees of Lebanon that were known for their strength, beauty, and fragrance, and Haram will be paid in food. And this may, from our perspective, seem like kind of an uneven trade. Solomon gets the, the grand trees of Lebanon, and and Haram gets some wheat and oil. But what's really important with this is that it wasn't an unfair trade, and that Haram knew exactly what his land needed. The land of Tyre was one that was in a cliffy environment and was unable to produce food. So by working with Solomon, Haram ensured this, the longevity of his, his, his community. So truly, all is well. 
The preparations of the temple seem to be underway with little to no hiccups. Work crews are assigned. Logs are cut and being prepared to be literally shipped out. Stones are being cut and brought to work sites. The foundation is literally being laid for the miraculously splendid and holy temple for the Lord. However, we know that Solomon's rule is not all smooth sailing, and that this temple, while it is holy and was built for a divine purpose, will ultimately crumble and fall, as human-made buildings do eventually. Solomon was cutting edge for his time. Earlier in 1 Kings, we see that Solomon is wanting to build alliances with others, wanting to invite other ways of cultural practice. And these things began as good actions, and they brought a lot of really good and necessary change. But these things will cause a separation from Solomon's original intent when he began his kingship. And this will ultimately be his downfall as he gives into destructive behaviors of power in others. Israel wanted a king, and the Lord granted them with many. When kings such as Solomon are in their rising period, they seem to have everything. Everything is going so well, and it's easy to sit in and think that that positive incline will go on forever. But they too shall fall, and Israel needs a king that cannot fall. And as we sit with this unfolding story of 1 Kings 5, we are reminded of what has already taken place and the events to come. We know that David had wanted to build this temple, but the Lord led him in another direction and paved the way for him to pass on his anointed kingship to his son, Solomon. And Solomon was born from Bathsheba. And while the events of David and Bathsheba can be talked about at a different time, this shows the divine timeline of events of this building of the temple that has taken place. And Solomon's continued reign is a part of that as well. And as we continue to read the events of of building the temple, all the events that Solomon conducts under his kingship, his inevitable fall, and other events are present. And we as humanity can find ourselves possibly feeling like David. We had a plan and a grand desire, all to be told no. Someone else will do it. Today, more than ever, we know what it feels like to have our plans suddenly changed and possibly our desires taken along a new course. That job that we loved is no longer available. That vacation that we planned and budgeted for It's no longer an option. Our plans to finally socially gather with friends and family we haven't seen in years has turned into screen sharing and Wi-Fi troubleshooting. Our marriage that began so in abundance feels more distant than ever. And that call to a position is not what we expected. We have to sit in this reality of change and unexpectation. And some of us may feel like Solomon. Our plans and desires are unfolding pretty darn well. We, we get that promotion that we wanted to. Our child gets that scholarship that they worked really hard for. And when things go really well, it's easy to settle and assume that these things will be on a positive increase forever. Ah, uh, yes, that mortgage finally gets paid off. We're golden. All is well. And for some of us, we find ourselves in the confusing middle, where things are going well, but there have been plenty of pretty significant changes and bumps along the way. And in the midst of the chaos and the life living that we experience, there is a temptation to think inwardly and focus on what is right in front of us and what the individual needs are met for what we need and what our lives need to move forward. And while, of course, there are moments when individual actions are necessary and plans need to be made, I wonder what it would look like to not think so much of what's in front of us, but to think what's happening around us and the people that are alongside us, whether they realize it or whether we realize it or not. 
I wonder what it would look like to share similar spaces together and share similar experiences to dwell together in a common place, but also to be in spaces of new learning, to learn from where others have been and to think less of what our immediate needs are and how we can be together in a community. And while we are building and processing through our own events, how can we embrace a community and how can we share in mutual alliances? Over the past two years, we have watched as our government leaders wrestle with difficult decisions and policies. We as a denomination have had to sit with tensions as reports come out from study committees, as synod gets postponed, and as overtures are written. We watch as brothers and sisters leave because they do not feel welcome. We see division separating one another as a result from different beliefs and different ways of being. We may not physically be building a temple that will ultimately crumble, but we fall into this disorienting and isolating ways of thinking in order to achieve a sense of perfection or a better reality. We have to ask ourselves the question of how do we change this? How do we as a holy universal church combat this tendency to build an empire for ourselves? And how do we think collectively together in an intentionally individualistic Western society? How do we open our doors into difference and yet be brought together because of that difference? And as we sit with these really heavy questions, let's take some time and go back to our, our first Kings 5 text. Solomon and Haram have arranged for a strong timber from Lebanon to be brought in. Stones are being cut, large workforces are being created. And after doing the math, approximately, if I round up, 18400,000 people between Solomon and Haram were together in this crew. And to kind of put that into our perspective, in 2021, the Christian Reformed Church did a tally of membership, and we were sitting right about 211,000. So that kind of gives you a perspective of clearly how huge this work crew was and how this was no small task for preparing and building the temple. And because Solomon was favored by God, he was given divine wisdom, and he was known for this wisdom. And we know how grand this wisdom was when we read chapters like Matthew 12, when Jesus talks about Solomon's wisdom. And when Jesus mentions Solomon and Matthew, he connects the wisdom that was given to Solomon, given by God, and the wisdom that he has. And Jesus is, being the tr is showing that he is the true source of wisdom and the true, the true king that has been waiting for but that Solomon was still given a divine gift of wisdom. And with the coming of Christ in the works, God is still present with the people in Solomon's day. God provided people with a king and a land and were able to, to navigate through that need. God provided people with what they needed and what they wanted. And despite the messiness of humanity, the Lord still blesses and accommodates his people. And he made it so that there was peace and clear guidance when compiling all of the materials needed from the outside nations. And these resources can be seen as an offering from the nations. These resources were coming in an abundance because the land of Israel needed that, land, that abundance, needed those trees, needed those people, needed those stones in order to complete this huge project. And this brings attention to the things and thinking of all the culmination of all of these resources into the things to come that we read about in Revelation, when all tribes and all nations come together in the second coming of Christ. And while that second coming will be a joyous occasion and will be a perfect coming together, we get glimpses of it found in our text in 1 Kings today. And even though we know that Solomon's rule was a difficult one and one that did not end well, grace still abounds in the life of Solomon. There is such grace in that David had too much blood on his hands 
that his son from Bathsheba, who David selfishly took for himself, would complete this monumental task of building a temple in the Lord's name. The Lord loved Solomon and found favor with him. And the temple for which Solomon built was a sacred space of worship. The temple was a symbol of Solomon's loyalty to God as his own king and his commitment to fulfill the will of God and, the rule, and to rule the nation. All of the buildings of the royal complex, all of the grand palaces, the grand buildings, they stood in a shadow in the balance when it came to this temple, the holy space of the king of kings. And the temple was a place where people could come and worship the Lord according to their customs and their laws. And while it is tempting to think about the inevitable future, this temple was a huge deal and required divine intervention for it to be completed and a covenant to be fulfilled. God had planned this from the very beginning. And it's simply amazing to see how God has worked in this divine plan that is present both in our text in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And as well as the current context that we find ourselves in, God has blessed and accommodated the people of Solomon and his reign and the people of Israel and God continues to bless and accommodate us and our messiness as broken, sinful beings. God has not left us to our own devices, but is present with us every step of the way. He's with us in the heights of the promotion, the debt payoff, the new relationship that's super exciting, dropping our kids off on time for the first time in a week, and all of these grand things that we count as really big wins. And he's also with us in the mundane. He's with us in that load of laundry we finally got to do. He's with us in getting our car repaired. He's with us in making a meal for our family. But he's also with us in the depths. He's with us when we're holding the hands of our dying loved one. He's with us in the doctor's offices with us in those difficult conversations. And he's with us in the dark spaces that no one seems to notice. There is a sacred space with him, and he holds that space for us. I remember back when I was an intern in our ESL program, and I had the chance to sit with several students one day during our snack and fellowship time, and one of them said to me, this is the most I've ever spent in a Christian church building. And another student agreed and mentioned that they were kind of afraid of not being a Christian, but, but being a part of this church to learn English. And I remember sitting with that and wondering, how to, what do I do with that? And while it is a prayer that all that come through the doors of COS would one day know the Lord, I was so thankful for these students and that they felt safe to share these things with, with me, um, but also they felt safe to be here and to learn English together. And I know for myself, one of the best things about being here in the ESL program was that I got to learn from the students. Sure, I, I was helping them fumble through English and helping them learn new ways of communication, but I learned way more than I, than I helped with. And I was able to learn alongside them, and I had the privilege to hear their stories and their ways of viewing the world that deeply impacted me and how I view the world. And it doesn't take long for visitors to notice that COS has a passion for wanting to understand those that are coming from different contexts and different traditions and different ways of life. For the past 50 years, COS has been a welcoming space for the immigrant, the refugee, those in prison, and so many other people. And these wonderful things, COS has done well. But there is still work to be done. There is always room to wonder where we can continue to give, but also how can we receive from our neighbors? How can we receive from our neighboring churches, our neighboring classes? And how can we receive from the city of Grand Rapids? So often we want to we wanna give what we have and we want to help, and those are great things. But how often do we think, what can we receive? What direction can we receive? 
Where is God leading us to learn? And in what ways can we be sacred spaces to others while in the midst of caring for ourselves? And how can we be bold enough to speak up against injustice? And dear friends, as we go into another week of trials, questions, joys, and laments, I sincerely hope that you feel God's warm presence on your unfolding story. That you feel that every minute and every detail is important. Some moments are wonderful moments that you can feel, yes, that is exactly where I need to be, and other moments are just too hard to comprehend. And there's room for both of those and all of the things in between. But every detail is important, and every detail is a part of where you need to be. And even when there are disappointments and heartbreak, closed doors, that is preparation for something far greater than you could have ever hoped for. But in the midst of the pain, I encourage you to embrace others along the way. I encourage you to think deeply about where you have become complacent and areas that you could use a redirection and new alliances in your life. To him be the glory. Thank you.